Glenn wanted the conversation about guns to evolve into a dialogue about control, particularly government control over the people. So he used history to make a point. Facts matter. This one I love. They say that we have one of the highest murder rates in the world, but if you take out the gun death rates in cities like Chicago, Detroit, the District of Columbia, and New Orleans, all progressive cities, where the gun laws are the strictest, America would have one of the lowest murder rates in the world. In fact, when you take out the progressive cities, America goes from the country with the third highest rate to one in the bottom 10. When somebody argues for gun control, they are either living in self-imposed ignorance or they are just living an argument of control. Then he focused the point on governments. And if a government had a monopoly of violence, tyranny then would go undefeated. No one would be able to stop it. And if you think, oh, gee, there he goes again with these crazy ideas, ask the Japanese Americans about the internment camps of World War II done by the beloved progressive president, FDR, through executive order. If you don't believe that the government can do terrible things to its citizens, please explain to me the Lakota Indians. The Lakota Indians that were asleep by the river when the troops arrived in the freezing cold on a December morning. This just went up. This billboard, turn in your arms, the government will take care of you. Gee, what's that about? This is politically incorrect, they've shouted all week. This is wrong, how dare you exploit the Indians? Oh please, lefties don't start with that. For everyone's protection, there by the river, the troops began early in the morning, in the December morning, to enter the Indians' tents. They were sleeping, but for their protection, they had to take those guns. There was one boy in one tent who was deaf. He tried to hold on to his gun. He tried to explain that he had paid a lot of money for that gun. And in the struggle to hang on to it, the gun discharged. And the U.S. soldiers stepped back and unloaded on a group of women and children and men, 300 in total. 150 of them were killed that December morning. Another, one, another 51 were wounded. People were trying to run across the creek completely unarmed. They were caught and killed by the soldiers without anything to defend themselves with. The creek, wounded knee, the year 1890. Now the reason why I came across wounded knee here recently is because I was looking at the number of medals of honor that the president was giving out. And I thought, boy, he seems to like have those in a Pez dispenser right now. But actually, actually he is giving them out at about the same rate as others. But nothing like Wounded Knee. 20 medals of honor were awarded to American soldiers for that massacre. 20. I want to give you a little perspective. Why that jumps off the page is because for D-Day, four Medal of Honors were given out. Battle of the Bulge, 17. Pearl Harbor, 15. The Indian slaughter, 20? Yes, the government and the media covered it up and they used an award to spin the tale. This gun, you want to, I don't know where I left my, Thank you. This gun here actually came from that tribe. This gun was taken. It wounded me. This gun should stand as a reminder 
of what a government can do to an innocent group of people for their safety. He focused on the irony of the political left claiming to be the party of civil rights, while also claiming to lead the gun control debate. He told the story of early African Americans and their guns to make the point. After the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery was over, but not really, not really. It's why Martin Luther King eventually marched. It didn't end after the Emancipation Proclamation. Why? Because, and do not take my word for it, look this up yourself, because of the pro-slavery Democrats in the South, they tried to disarm the blacks because the last thing they could do is have those people witness true freedom even after they were declared free and they were reading and educating themselves trying to lift themselves out of poverty up from slavery as Booker T. Washington would say the very last thing the very last attempt to keep them in check was gun control the sheriff would come and take away the guns at night and lo and behold wouldn't you know it within a couple of days here would come the Klan if they weren't allowed to protect themselves what good would all the knowledge be? It would all be useless in the face of a gun or a midnight raid or a torch or a sword. A lot of times people couldn't do anything about it because they didn't have a gun, because their right had been taken away by the government. Now, if you have a gun and the Klan comes knocking at your door, how is that freedom exactly? If you don't have a gun, how could you protect yourself? In light of media stereotypes about the South and gun owners, some would have advised against talking about the Klan, but since Glenn didn't think that about the crowd, it didn't matter. And by the crowd reaction, he was right. And his next story would prove to be the most effective. In Alabama in 1956, you needed a permit to carry a gun. A black preacher who knew his rights, more importantly, knew his people's history. He took his job as the father, the patriarch of his family. He took his job, his duty as the protector of his family seriously. And as things began to heat up in his world, he did the right thing. A citizen of good standing, he went down to the police station and he filled an application out so he could have a concealed carry permit so he could legally carry a gun. But because he was considered a challenge to the people who were at that time in control of the system, the Alabama police told Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, oh, Reverend, I'm sorry. We'd sure like to give you a permit to carry a gun, but for your own safety, sir, for your own safety, we just don't think you should have that permit. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, owned several firearms. How many people even know that fact? He owned several firearms and he was denied the right to carry a gun for his own safety. I'm sorry, let me hear from the left some more about gun control. Is there anyone within the sound of my voice believes that that man was denied a concealed carry because it was in his best interest? <laughs> 